Hello and welcome to the Cyber Den with your host, me, Jake the Voice. Anyway, we've got another lovely gentleman here to chat to on the Cyber Den. So please welcome professional voice actor and singer Stig Sidtangen, best known as the voice of Simon from Cry of Fear. Thanks for coming, mate. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and I apologize for butchering your name right there, but uh, let's roll with it. Let's roll with it. <laughs> well, that's quite okay. <laughs> anyway, anyway, let's start talking about uh, inspirations now. So what inspired you to become a voice actor and a singer? Singing is something I've done for quite a while. Um, actually, from when I was uh, just a little kid. Uh, I don't remember this personally, uh, but my parents told me that I came into the garage uh, during the 17th of May, which is a national holiday in Norway, uh, where the whole um, uh, marching band uh, were having a break uh, in between. And uh, I kind of just uh, stood up to them and I uh, started singing from these children's songs that we were learning in school. <laughs> um, but uh, after that, I I just sang mostly as a hobby at first. Uh, and then I went and uh, got a bachelor's and a master's degree uh, in classical song. Uh, so I, I actually came back from an assignment uh, today uh, in between. For the voiceover, it's uh, it's a bit more random how it actually started because I've been uh, I've always been interested in uh, video games all the way back from uh, playing uh, at this Sega Master System and suddenly I found myself in the situation that I'd moved out uh, and I was uh, going to study for uh, acting um, at school and uh, I'd moved into an apartment and my internet connection wasn't up. So it uh, it was gonna take a couple of uh, a couple of days before they uh, got that running. Uh, but I brought uh, along a couple of discs uh, from uh, this kind of computer magazine uh, discs. If you remember those, uh, I'm feeling old already. My hair's uh, <laughs> turning grey now. You mentioned that. Yeah, kind of like PC gamer or computer for everyone or what it's called. Uh, and one of those discs had this uh, Half Life One modification uh, called uh, Azure Sheep. Uh, which is one of the one of the better Half-Life uh, one mods of old, if you ask me. And I, as I figured, oh, okay, I've got lots of time to kill. Uh, I got nothing to do. Uh, might as well try these. Uh, it looks interesting. And uh, so I played that. I was uh, I was astounded by the level of quality for it for being like a hobby project. And a couple of days later, I finally got my internet connection. And the first thing I did was go straight to uh, to Google to search for mods, and I found moddb.com. Uh, and I kind of just gorged myself on mods for Half-Life 1 and 2 for uh, like a whole week, I think. And then while playing this, I figured it's like this voiceover for this, this is something I could do as well. Uh, this is something I'm really interested in. This is something I want to do. And I I bought one of these handy portable recorders, uh, like uh, from Zoom, uh, Zoom H4, it was called. Uh, and the, the recording quality on it was uh, pretty good for, uh, for uh, what it was. Uh, so I figured out. Oh, Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll try using that to record something in between and use it for practice. And then that's pretty much how it all started. <laughs> Your singing background makes me kind of kick myself because I didn't prepare this uh, interview in a, in a musical fashion. I should have interviewed uh, <laughs> you throwing questions at you while singing a bit my way and then singing <laughs> a bit from you. Ah, maybe not. Anyway. <laughs> That sounds good, though. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Anyway, so what about favourites, though? What about um, who would you consider perhaps your favourite voice actors out there from games and beyond, or perhaps uh, favourite singers as well? Well, for voice actors, I, I was um, I really liked uh, the the voice actor who did um, uh, Dead Space, uh, the original games for the second and the third game when he was voiced. Uh, the voice actor, uh, oh, I don't remember his, remember his name, uh, but uh, I was really impressed with uh, his work in that game. Anyone else come to mind? Any other games uh, out there? Uh, nothing that I particularly uh, think about. Um, no, sorry. <laughs> well, at least you're honest. So, what about <laughs> singers, though? What about singers from, uh, you know, performance artists or bands or anything like that? Who, who comes to mind there? Oh, several. Uh, Pavarotti is uh, probably one of the biggest. 
Uh, you also have uh, Placido Domingo, uh, uh, Mario Lanza, uh, a lot of these uh, very famous uh, classical tenors. Any, anybody else? A, I feel like I've covered most of them. Oh, there's also, um, oh, Jesus. Uh, oh, what is his name? Oh, the, oh, I feel stupid for not uh, remembering it uh, just right off the bat, but uh, the guy who's blind. <laughs> Yeah, don't expect me to help out here. I'm confused. Um, <laughs> uh, plays the piano. He's, a, he's a now living. Yeah, he's a, he's a living today. S Stevie Wonder. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, um, let's see if I can. Ah, Andrea Bocelli, of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm way off there. I'm <laughs> galactic miles off there with that guess of mine. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, the, the style is uh, very different. I mostly do classical music, uh, so kind of like yeah. Um, for example, Romanzas uh, from, for example, Schubert, uh, Schumann, Edward Grieg, uh, all of these uh, ro romantic period uh, classical musicians. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, classical church music like Handel and uh, Mozart, uh, Haydn, uh, the, you know, that kind of uh, area of uh, music, so to speak. I actually uh, did uh, uh, some solo uh, work uh, on uh, a piece uh, by Bach, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, which is called uh, The Passion of St. John, uh, which was a really, really a uh, uh, big challenge. Uh, the, the arias there are known for being really difficult, uh, and I, 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 I felt like standing there singing it that I barely managed to do it, but uh, my wife assured me that it sounded pretty good. <laughs> Let's move away from, of course, talking about uh, just general voice actors and singers and whatnot. And let's, of course, bring the conversation right back to you. And talking about, of course, um, perhaps your most famous role. And that is, of course, as Simon, the protagonist of Cry of Fear. The uh, uh, exceptionally dark, but uh, incredibly memorable, of course, uh, Half-Life mod. So... How is it that you got the role, and uh, how would you describe your experiences voicing him? Well, I feel like I was uh, a, a bit in the right place at the right time uh, kind of deal. Uh, because I, I saw that they were... I don't remember if I saw that they were advertising that they were looking for voice actors, or if I was uh, during my, uh, my binge on mods, uh, when I was uh, looking through all the projects that I just kind of stumbled across Cryofear and just sent uh, Andreas uh, Runberg a message and asked him, I was like, are, are you looking for voice actors? If so, then uh, hello. <laughs> um, and uh, so I just uh, sent in uh, an uh, audition uh, for Simon uh, for this. I, just, I think I just sent him uh, some of my past work because I'd done uh, Cube Experimental, uh, which was a Fallout New Vegas mod, I think it was. For uh, based on the Cube uh, horror franchise, and uh, after listening to that, uh, he uh, I was taken on board. The experience in itself was it was really cool. I only applied for some uh, a few a selection of uh, mods before this, and uh, working with Cryo Fear was very different uh, in a very positive way because uh, when you uh, when you apply for a modification, you usually just get. Uh, a Word document, and then you have a couple of lines uh, here and there, uh, you say this, and maybe if you're lucky it's uh, you say this in response to <laughs> to this. Uh, but for Cry of Fear, I, I usually got uh, like a storyboard cut out, so I could see uh, Andreas had drawn what was going to happen visually. Um, so, for example, Simon turns uh, to see something happening over there, and then there's the line, and then there's music cue. So I, I got all this information, and that really helped uh, to figure out how to say things. Aside from that, uh, I, every once in a while I got a message uh, with, uh, that a new scene uh, was ready. And uh, then we, re we recorded uh, that, uh, that scene, and it was uh, gradually implemented into the... Uh, running test build and just playing the test build itself was a kind of a horror in itself uh, because uh, suddenly uh, uh, I just got this test build uh, updated as as it went uh, so at a certain point there was just an empty hallway and uh, me being kind of new to the whole thing of testing games uh, I figured I was like oh 
uh, an empty hallway. It's probably just to break up uh, a bit of the tension. And then suddenly this empty hallway wasn't so empty anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I kind of got jump scared every time I played the new build because uh, something new was uh, entered into the game all the time <laughs> without any warning. <laughs> now I remember um I remember having like a bit of a conversation with uh my girlfriend because when I played the mod I was streaming it for her she um she has played it before and she knows about it etc and i was new to it so it was all to me all of these were kind of like surprises and whatnot and she told me that uh in regards to your performance that you were very much kind of like um you know quite new and fresh to voice acting but over time like your performance kind of gradually gets better and much more like you know there's more passion there's more emotion more uh, deliveries and whatnot um you know things like that would you agree with that? Would you say that as you recorded more of the lines, as more of them got implemented over time as the project went along, would you say that your performance perhaps picked up and perhaps you, you know, kind of refined your skills over time? Would yeah, you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because uh, at, the, uh, at the same time as I was working on this, I was uh, working on other mod, uh, mod projects uh, as well. Uh, and I also had classes in acting at the same time. Um, so there was like a, a double up of uh, experience uh, in there. And of course, uh, as you start working with this character, you kind of you kind of get a bit more into the actual character. And uh, as you play test the game as well, you, you kind of get uh, more soaked uh, into both the atmosphere uh, and how you uh, how you want something to sound. And it's also like you said, there's uh, there's more emotion into it because it's it, it's uh, it's kind of hard to get emotions to sound believable uh, when you do voiceover, because if you if you go over the top, uh, it kind of sounds it sounds like you're trying too hard in a <laughs> in a way, but if you try to tone it down too much, it kind of just sounds like you're uh, reading off the script uh, as it is. So uh, in a way. I, I think I can actually pull some of the classical music in here as well because you have to feel like you you do it like you exaggerate it by just a bit. You have to feel like you're doing a bit too much. And when you do a bit too much, it's perfect. <laughs> kind of a weird way to phrase it, maybe. But uh, uh, that's usually when you hit the sweet spot. Uh, at least in classical music, it holds very true. And I, I think that carried over into the acting. So do you have any favorite moments or lines in Cry of Fear? Anything that, like that that sticks out to you? Well, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's the one uh, where he confronts the, the doctor up in the attic. Uh, this is also something that uh, a lot of others have uh, uh, mentioned to me, that they really like this line. Uh, when he's been following this doctor and trying to find him uh, to get uh, uh, revenge for being shot uh, in the insane asylum. And he finally uh, confronts him up in the attic. And uh, he's like, there you are. You're dead. You're so fucking dead. Uh, there's just a... <laughs> it was just so fun doing that line because he, he is he's so so furious with this guy. He, he really wants to kill him. And uh, it, it's such an easy uh, kind of emotion to make so plain into the line. Um, there's also a couple of others uh, that I really liked. Uh, of course, there's the joke lines. I don't know how many of them you've heard. Uh, you heard a couple of them? Yeah, my missus have uh, treated me to those as well. Thank you, Alice, by the way. Shout out to you. Yeah, she yeah. told me about those and like, uh, I think, for example, the, the famous secret uh, French assault rifle and being, I can't remember the exact line, stuff like, oh, French. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh, oh. French. It's like uh, uh, the instructions I got for that line was uh, pretty much just a uh, picture that you're holding the most disgusting thing in the world <laughs> and you're not being shy about it. <laughs> um, aside from that, uh, there's uh, also the joke ending uh, where it's uh, the main character from uh, uh, spoilers, by the way, uh, for those who haven't played it. Um, the main character from uh, Afraid of Monsters is the one that actually hits Simon with the car. Uh, and everything that you play from the moment he gets hit and up to the ending is pretty much just uh, Simon uh, hallucinating the whole thing. And then when he uh, confronts uh, this guy, he, he exits the car, uh, this uh, main character from Afraid of Monsters, David. And Simon is like crushed into the wall and he's like, What? You? But why? 
<laughs> and the answer from David is like, ah, oh, sorry, man, I'm stoned. <laughs> and uh, I, I thought that one was a, uh, it was a really funny uh, kind of ending, uh, even though it was uh, the joke ending. It's uh, it's not canon uh, in any kind of way. <laughs> and uh, of course, also there's uh, it's not uh, just a single line, but I was. Uh, uh, really, uh, really happy with uh, how the ending uh, monologues turned out. Uh, the the first one is probably the one which is the most emotional, uh, and uh, the one that I think it was the the funnest to do. Uh, but then you have the 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 canon ending, which is the fourth ending, which is a bit more uh, down to earth. Uh, as he's not really angry at anything, it's more kind of like resigned, uh, where he uh, ends up uh, shooting these police officers and he kind of just, instead of blaming everything else, he actually has to have a come to Jesus moment and uh, uh, find that he he actually needs help. Uh, he has to do something with this and he can't put the blame on uh, anybody else. Um, so that one was uh, a bit more challenging to do uh, acting wise, I feel, because uh, in, again, you 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 don't want to overdo it because it sounds cheesy, but at the same time, you don't want to mute it all too much down because it will sound it will sound uh, not genuine uh, if you get my meaning. So, which of these cry of fear endings? to you is uh, what, what you would consider to be canon, but also which one of these do you kind of consider like a personal favorite? Uh, well, uh, the fourth ending is uh, the one that is officially uh, canon, uh, because that's uh, kind of where uh, Simon gets his uh, good ending uh, in the very large... Uh, uh, I'm making these double fingers, <laughs> quotation marks, <laughs> that's what it is. But I think maybe the most, uh, the one that I had the most fun with uh, was ending one because it's so visceral. Uh, it's uh, there's just so much anger and uh, uh, vitriol in, in the whole ending there uh, th- that you kind of you can pretty much just let loose and it it won't sound exaggerated because he is he's kind of just spiraling having uh, this mental breakdown. Uh, the moment before he uh, he kills himself, pretty much. It is a, it's a moment before he uh, pulls the trigger. But uh, maybe one of uh, one of the others that I felt was really hard to do was uh, this one ending uh, where he kind of assumes uh, maybe too much responsibility in a way, because you have you have five endings. You have the first ending, which is the angry ending, angry at the world. Every everybody else is terrible, <laughs> which is uh, the I don't am I am I allowed to swear on this uh, in this podcast? It's not a podcast. I, I, maybe I've done it already. I think. Yeah, you already did. It's not a podcast. It's a radio interview. But luckily for you, it's oh, yeah, pre-recorded. Yeah, 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 yeah. Radio. Yeah, sorry, but I'm allowed to swear. Like I say, it's a pre-recorded interview. So go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's pretty much the fuck you ending, <laughs> the, the first ending, uh, the, the really angry, every uh, fuck everybody, everybody, uh, I hate everybody, I hate the world, this is the quickest exit. Uh, that's pr- pretty much the, the first ending. Uh, it's the one I had the most uh, fun with, uh, really, uh, recording. Uh, but for uh, the second and the third ending are a bit more ambivalent, would be probably be the way to phrase it. Uh, at least I think it's the third ending where he's really, uh, really muted. Uh, he's kind of like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry I exist kind of ending. It's like everything is terrible. Uh, sorry, doctor, that you can't help me. Uh, my, uh, uh, my love interest uh, didn't want me, but that's okay because I killed her. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like the the uh, the ending uh, uh, for that one, and uh, for the whole thing, it's uh, the whole text implies that it's so muted, he's just so down uh, that in order to record that, I I just laid down on the floor uh, and held my recorder, and then I just started talking like it was uh, like you're just completely relaxed and just like no everything everything is depressed. <laughs> But yeah, the first one uh, for uh, the general uh, inspiration to it and how wild you can go with it. And the fourth one for the mainly for the difficulty and the nuance uh, in it. 
You know, I'm, I'm going to uh, throw in another anecdote here. I apologise if anyone was listening and going, oh, God, he's talking again. When I was playing Cry of Fear and, again, streaming for my missus at the time, and I made the, you know, the key choices in the game that influence what ending you get, and she told me about these endings, and I remember each time I made a decision, she was like, oh, I can't believe you did that. And I was like... Did I do something wrong? It's like, oh no, I'm going to get the worst ending. I've, I've broken the law. I've broken Sharia law. I've done something bad here. Like, oh, I'm, I'm going to make Simon's life worse. And then right to the end, she said, you just got the best ending. Like, what? what? I did. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it's not very obvious. Uh, that's uh, what path you're actually taking uh, by these things. Because everything that's uh, that happens uh, during the game is uh, very closely linked uh, to uh, Simon's mental state and his well-being. So uh, whenever he kind of throws, uh, w when the game starts to get difficult, even when uh, outside of these uh, psychosis uh, periods uh, where the whole world kind of twists out of this uh, more realistic uh, kind of uh, world and gets into these bloody walls and hands from the floor and everything, even outside of that, uh, I've always in, uh, uh, seen it as uh, Simon wanting to hurt himself through the book, uh, in a way. He kind of throws all this, he wants the main character to suffer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a lot of kind of like allegories and metaphors kind of alluding to all of these things along the way, which, again, I, which I always think is pretty damn clever. I think it's a very raw kind of game. It's very raw and, like, unapologetically gritty. And that's one of the reasons yeah. why I really love uh, how the game is basically depicted and written and just, like, presented everything. And I think a lot of other people do as well. I think a lot of people are very much kind of um, perhaps in certain ways... Uh, perhaps relate to uh, Simon's struggles, you know, considering struggles mm. with mental health these days. Like my, my most, I myself, you know, I've I've battled my personal demons and and whatnot, and so with many other people out there as well. Again, so mm. what? How how do you feel, kind of knowing that you know that there are so many people out there who not only, of course, you know, appreciate Simon as a great protagonist and great uh, performance, but but also kind of like you know they perhaps kind of relate to him they, they see the character that you portrayed as someone that they can like you know can relate to this guy yeah I, i've actually had uh, messages uh, from uh, people after the game was released uh, saying that uh, the game made a huge impact uh, on their lives because they've been struggling with uh, depression and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, problems and it, it's really humbling uh, to hear that they've had uh, that the game has given such a huge positive impact and uh, well yeah I, I really get like a you get kind of like a bit at a loss for words uh, how to describe it uh, but it's a it's a really really warm uh, feeling to know that you that you made such a huge impact uh, and that uh, maybe it's helped them uh, maybe maybe explore some uh, some kind of uh, inner demons in a in a more safe way, maybe, uh, so that they can uh, uh, get some closure around the whole thing. So what was your reaction to the general popularity and reception of the mod, especially these days? I think uh, these days it's uh, perhaps it's me, perhaps it's me uh, stumbling into the party labor. I think these days, especially that the game seems to be a lot more kind of like picked up on, uh, or at least in recent times, a lot more picked up on, a lot more discussed and analysed and dissected in all sorts yeah. of videos and whatnot. So, again, what is your <laughs> reaction to this, you know, the increasing popularity of Cry of Fear? Well, uh, it's it's starting to become a somewhat old game uh, at this point. So, I, I'm uh, in a way, I'm a bit surprised that it's actually picking up traction. But at the same time, it's uh, well, it's a it's a game that had a really really large place uh, in the uh, in the mod community and in the horror game uh, uh, gestalt, maybe uh, to use a larger word that I'm uh, <laughs> that I normally use, um, and I, I I follow this. I, I usually search for Cry of Fear uh, somewhat regularly just to see if there's anybody else who made like one of these uh, deep dive videos into the lore of the game because there's a lot to pick up there. There's a lot of uh, um, symbolism. There's a lot of themes uh, that have been either fully or partially uh, covered. 
And uh, well, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how much uh, from of the stuff that I that I know personally uh, that uh, that's been uh, uncovered uh, fully. And uh, sometimes the uh, people find some kind of connection that I wasn't aware of myself either, and that's uh, equally interesting. It's a uh, really cool to see how people dive into this. And have you seen? I'm sure you have, of course, seen the many kind of bits of fan art and animations, all sorts of fan creations like that for people expressing their love for Cry of Fear? Yeah, and I, I think it's great. Uh, I think it's cool uh, that uh, people make art uh, for this. Uh, I also had a couple of pieces uh, given to me. Uh, some people just uh, uh, contact me, talk uh, talk a bit, uh, and then suddenly it's like, hey, uh, I made some art for you. <laughs> <laughs> related to Cry of Fear. I was like, oh, oh wow, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so uh, one of those pieces I use, uh, use on my Discord uh, user uh, that I use as my profile picture. And that was one of those uh, types of uh, art that I just, uh, that I got uh, from a fan. So do you ever think that uh, a sequel or a remake or anything like that might happen in the future? And would you reprise your role if so? If there's a remake, I I would I would definitely uh, I would definitely do it. Uh, I'm not sure if my voice sounds uh, young enough anymore. Uh, uh, the my 40s is uh, <laughs> charging up on me. Uh, they they seem closer than they should be. <laughs> so I might not sound like a teenager uh, anymore uh, by the time if it at all happens anytime. Which is, uh, it was sad when uh, there, there was a remake in the making, uh, which uh, Andreas has uh, shown a bit of footage from. But it uh, it never, uh, it was cancelled uh, at a certain time, uh, which was a really huge shame. Uh, and I, I doubt that there will ever be a sequel, uh, seeing as uh, he, he's not a fan of sequels. Uh, so uh, if there was, if there were anything coming uh, in relation to Cry of Fear, I would... I would assume it would be a remake, if anything, uh, but uh, I, I've never heard anything that it's uh, be that anything like that is being made, uh, or that there are plans for it at all. Well, on the plus side, at least there's plenty of um, you know kind of fan mods, fan creations of uh, additional content for the game. So there's that at the very least. And also, um, sh- quick shout out to Andreas if you're listening, mate. There's a spot in the Cyberden if you're ever interested in an interview. So <laughs> get your ass down here and let's get chatting, please. <laughs> Anyway, let's start talking about other kind of projects that you've been in. I mean, you've been in quite a number of um, of Command & Conquer mods, so tell us more about those. Are you a big kind of Command & Conquer fan, or just in general, real-time strategy game fan? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I started uh, playing the, the original Command & Conquer uh, back when that was new. <laughs> uh, and after that, I, I followed the series all the way through Red Alert, uh, Tiberian Sun, uh, all the expansion packs for all these games. Uh, the Ant levels for Red Alert in particular were one of my favorites. And I was uh, pleasantly surprised when I saw that they had included it uh, in the remake. And of course, Red Alert 2, uh, Command & Conquer 3, all the games leading up to, uh, I think it was around, what was it Command & Conquer 4? Which had this kind of uh, different take uh, on how they wanted the game to be, uh, which is uh, around the time when uh, the whole franchise died, pretty much, until they uh, released the remake uh, for the original Command & Conquer and Red Alert 1 uh, recently, which I, of course, had to play. <laughs> But yeah, I, I've done a lot of uh, command, uh, a lot of uh, strategy games for this. Uh, one of the biggest is probably Rise of the Reds. I think. Uh, I think they internally kind of joke, uh, call, uh, joke about it, calling me Mister ECA, uh, which is. Uh, uh, do you know Rise of the Reds? By name, but I haven't actually tried that mod myself. Yeah, uh, it's a Command and Conquer Generals uh, Zero Hour mod. Uh, so you have the the three main uh, factions uh, which you had in the main game: uh, um, the United States, uh, China, and uh, the Middle Eastern coalition called GLA. But uh, they also add uh, Russia as a faction, and there's also the ECA, which is the European Continental Alliance. And uh, there are a lot of Scandinavian units in the European Continental Alliance, <laughs> so to speak. 
Um, so they've been joking. I, I, I think I heard that they joked about it being uh, that I was Mr. ECA because I have like, I think I have five uh, units for that faction alone, which is everything from the builder unit, uh, like a bulldozer, which is a Swedish kind of thing, to a cryo tank, which blasts uh, this kind of ice beam. And has a lot of uh, Norwegian jokes about alcohol and uh, and snow and uh, yeah, <laughs> that kind of stuff in it. Uh, to the main weapons platform, uh, which is called the Pandora, uh, which has uh, like an antimatter artillery cannon, uh, which has a really dark edge to it uh, because the lines are uh, something along the lines of uh, turning keys in three, two, one. And never again may our children forgive us. It's a, it's, a, it's kind of really dark. The whole weapon is like they know that they're destroying uh, parts of the parts of the world by using it, uh, and how dangerous it is. But it's uh, in a way, it's necessary. It's like a necessary sacrifice. I also done. Uh, there's a mod for uh, Command and Conquer uh, uh, Three, uh, which is called the Forgotten, which is a really, really old project that I did for a long, long time ago where I had a couple of units, uh, the commando unit, for example, <laughs> uh, the, this kind of like a, who runs around and you play C4 on structures, that kind of commando. I also done a good few of other projects. Uh, I think the, there's a mod called Almost Perfect Uris Revenge, which is a Red Alert 2 mod. I did a couple of units for that project. Uh, there's one called Red Alert 2. Uh, it's called New new war i think or something along those lines and there's a, a bunch of unreleased uh um, command and conquer uh, red alert 3 mods as well that i did some voiceover for which is mainly just on my youtube channel at the moment because they were like i said they were never released so i just uh, thought it was fun to uh, showcase uh, some of it but i think that's mostly the extent of the strategy games that i've done Actually, you mentioned Almost Perfect Yuri's Revenge, a.k.a. Mental Omega. I actually voiced yeah. a few uh, units on that as well. Small World. Oh, yeah, I, I thought your voice was uh, familiar. <laughs> 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 but, uh, which units did you make? Uh, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, it's been a long while, because I remember I voiced a few units in that... And also, I'm, I'm simultaneously like searching out my own bloody resume here, just to double check. Um, <laughs> I I voiced. Um, I know. I know for sure that, and I'm kind of bummed that this didn't go any further. In the trailer to, for like Mod DB, kind of Mod of the Year, I voiced yeah. Yuri. So um, I actually, you know, was given like a, a script, like a slightly modified script of um, his uh, propaganda speech in the original, like Red Alert to Yuri's Revenge. You know, saying like, um, like <laughs> empty your mind and submit to oh. my will. <laughs> you know, things like that. And oh, well, that sounds exactly like him, though. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I voiced in that, and I also did, did um, Twisted Insurrection for. Um, Command and Conquer Tiberian Sun kind of standalone mod. Uh, yeah, again, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah, like I wish, honestly, I wish I was able to kind of voice more lines for um, Mental Omega, but I never got res a response back uh, ever since it was years ago. And oh yeah, it says Riot Trooper Ram Wagon. I remember the Ram Wagon. I really like <laughs> hammed it in that and the Atlanta Sky Station for um, Mental Omega. Like this is ages ago. I was like twenty or so when I did this, so I can't remember <laughs> most of this. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, did you see which uh, lines I did for it? Uh, no, which ones? Do tell, do tell. I, oh, uh, I think it was for um, uh, was it the Sen um, was it the Sentinel or was that for a different project? Because there was there was uh, I think that was for this. Uh, there was a unit called Sentinel, uh, which uh, but it was a Chinese unit, so it doesn't kind of fit. So I, I'm uh, I think I might have uh, misremembered that part. Uh, it was like a flak cannon uh, kind of. Defending China's airspace. <laughs> but there was a... Oh, no, uh, a Burillo, I think. Uh, um, uh, it's like a flame uh, tank APC kind of deal. Oh, what was the main uh, line for that? Um, uh, the, it was a... I think it was a Russian unit. So Burillo. Oh, it's been so long. I, I don't remember <laughs> any of the lines anymore. <laughs> uh, did, uh, did Have you done any lines for uh, Dawn of War uh, Coalescence? I have not. Honestly, I really wish I had uh, kind of put more emphasis on starring in more 
RTS mods. But I'm, you know, I'm always open to it. If any, if there's any real-time strategy mods out there, and if you want to <laughs> get more voices, hire Stig and hire me. We'll do them. Why <laughs> not? Let's do it as a package deal. Yeah, um, uh, because uh, that one I forgot uh, just off the bat because uh, that's uh, that's a mod for Dawn of War, uh, the 40, uh, 40k Warhammer 40k universe, and I've done so, I've done so many characters. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't get why I didn't remember that immediately uh, because there there's so many units for that. I, I I haven't put out videos for all of the characters that I've done even. Uh, and I think I have, I think I found out that I've done 30 plus characters uh, for that game <laughs> across all the factions. <laughs> Okay, now, speaking more generally, of course, speaking more generally and broadly, so are there any other kind of video game roles or mods or anything like that? Any others that have stood out to you? Any personal favorites? Well, there's there's uh, Virgil from uh, Portal Stories, Mel. Uh, that is probably uh, one of my uh, my big favorites uh, because he is just, he is so animated uh, almost all the time. And uh, the the head writer for uh, the game, Ian uh, Weiss, uh, he, uh, me and him had worked on some stuff before that. And uh, he kind of figured when he was writing this for this project, he he uh, he envisioned me as that character even before it was finished. So he kind of made it as how how would Stieg say this? <laughs> how would uh, how would maybe he respond to some of these things? Uh, and it also made it really funny to do the actual lines uh, once it was finished, because it uh, there, there was so much life uh, in that writing. It was really easy to get into character. Um, and I also got to try to impersonate uh, Cave Johnson from the Portal universe, which uh, I've been told went r terrible. <laughs> but the, the rest I was very happy with. <laughs> Aside from that, there's, uh, there's also... Uh, a couple of titles on Steam at the moment. Uh, one of the most recent one is uh, Remorse: The List, which is uh, also a horror game. Uh, it's made by the same guy who made uh, the Half-Life 2 horror mod uh, Gray. Uh, so that was really cool uh, to be able to work uh, on uh, uh, on a, a Steam title. It's also a game that was released on console. Uh, so it was released on. Uh, uh, PlayStation, on Xbox, uh, I think it's even uh, on Nintendo Switch. Uh, so that's like the, the first the first console title, <laughs> which I thought was really, really funny uh, to be a part of. Aside from that, I also worked on uh, Contagion, uh, the zombie game on Steam, and did uh, um, a character there, which is a, a more uh, kind of a Spanish uh, character, which is... Uh, which, which is amusing in itself because I'm, I'm not fluent in Spanish. I I think I barely speak a word of it. Uh, but uh, uh, in order to get that character, to get that Spanish uh, pronunciation to all the words, I I had to find some kind of reference to use, and uh, so I I landed on the uh, the that woman from. Um, uh, modern family, uh, the Spanish-speaking one, uh, the, because she has a really, uh, really clear Spanish accent. And it's a, it was a really, really easy to pick up on and use that as an uh, as an accent. <laughs> Now, let's move a bit more away from uh, video games. Let, let's talk more about the um, singing side of things. So, how exactly did you kind of uh, break into the field of singing, kind of uh, further your career in this side of things? Well, I've uh, like I said, I've always done a bit of song uh, every now and then, uh, but that was uh, mainly my focus uh, when I started doing uh, my education. Uh, so I uh, straight out of uh, what would be college uh, in England, um, I went straight to a musical theater academy uh, school and did two years there. And uh, after that, there was this uh, my stint with the uh, with acting school uh, for two years, and then I went over to the classical route instead of musical and uh, theater, and uh, had uh, four years of my bachelor's degree and two years of my master's. Uh, it uh, it only picked up uh, while I was doing my master's, really, uh, because uh, when I uh, applied uh, to the university there, 
um, I uh, kind of got uh, a foot in uh, with uh, the local concert house as a part of the university. Uh, so I, I kept working uh, with them for quite a while uh, as part of the professional choir. Uh, and we did a lot of music there. Um, and also I, I, I know a few people uh, in my local region. And there's, uh, there's uh, one guy who... Uh, sets uh, the several projects every year, um, so I, I work with him uh, on a lot of projects, and that's uh, the, the the same guy who set up the the Bach uh, project. But aside from that, it's uh, through school, uh, through acquaintances, through my website sometimes, um, and aside from that, mostly just going to auditions and uh, applying for applying for stuff really. I'm I'm not so lucky uh, with the uh, the classical music that people approach me, <laughs> uh, as I'm with uh, voiceover where I've done a lot of uh, different work. Uh, there, every once in a while, there's somebody who approaches me and and asks if uh, if I'm interested in uh, doing this or that. Uh, so it kind of kind of trickles in by itself uh, in some cases. What performances that you've taken part in yourself, uh, which of these have stood out to you? Live performances, recorded ones, anything like that? Well, for the recorded ones, uh, there's, uh, well, of course, there's Cry of Fear. Uh, that is uh, the, the biggest one, I think. Uh, there's that, Portal Stories, Mel. I've also done uh, an audio guide for a museum in Poland. Uh, there's uh, this uh, Solidari uh, Solidarity Museum in uh, Gdansk, uh, Solidarność uh, Museum, where I did the Norwegian audio guide uh, for that. And that I, th that I found really, really cool uh, to have been able to do. Uh, let's see what else, aside from games... I also done some advertising. I actually I sang at uh, one of the advertising jobs that I did. It was during COVID, so they had this uh, advertising for a kind of pet uh, pet shop chain where there was this Norwegian singer uh, singing about uh, all the things that uh, pets do wrong, but they're adorable anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> That was also uh, pretty cool to do. There's also so many other things, but uh, I, I did some stuff during um, uh, acting and film school, uh, which are probably what the ones that uh, uh, <laughs> are of particular note, because uh, what happened in those is kind of like the stuff you only uh, see in the film and that kind of stuff. Because we were uh, at one of these, uh, we were um, we were filming a, a vampire uh, short movie. Uh, so it was a collaboration between the acting class and the film class and uh, the makeup line. So they they made us up with these what we call the twilight ish uh, so uh, the snarls in latex uh, on our brows. So that you uh, or Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, vampires. Uh, uh, hard to explain, uh, but it, uh, it looked really, really strange. Uh, it, it was supposed to look like you were like a feral uh, kind of being. And uh, we were filming this in Oslo, and we were close to the river and uh, filming this under a bridge. So I was one of the henchmen uh, in this uh, regard, and I was supposed to run at the main character who was supposed to pick me up uh, by the by the throat and throw me into the wall. And to, to make that scene look believable that I was thrown into this wall, uh, I had to take a running start to this wall and try to roll off it uh, <laughs> uh, without uh, hurting myself, but uh, yeah, to make it look right. So I, I started rehearsing this. I did it slowly. Uh, so I, I, I held out my arm uh, as I approached. And I felt, okay, I meet here, and I collapse a bit with the arm. I roll off and uh, into the wall and down. I did that several times until I got a speed that I felt was uh, uh, all right, still safe, but it looked uh, genuine. And then the, <laughs> the producer, he comes over to me and is like, hey, that looks really cool, uh, but uh, can you do it like over there, uh, like uh, one, uh, two meters to the other side? Because there's better lighting there. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Wall is wall. Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> but wall was not wall. So when I started running into this uh, and stretched out my hand, I managed to hit the one area where there was a brick missing. And of course, when I expected to meet wall, there was no wall. And uh, I kind of hesitated, but my uh, I had enough speed uh, that uh, I couldn't stop myself. 
So I went face first into this uh, <laughs> brick wall and uh, just tumbled down on my uh, on my on my ass. And <laughs> Uh, and you, you you know this feeling when you really hurt yourself yourself it feels like you uh, you get this um uh almost like uh when you hit your elbow uh at uh, a plate it's kind of kind of like feels like you get this uh shakes uh, all the way up the arm like this these vibrations almost uh it was kind of like that uh except with a bit of uh, blood taste in my mouth and the only thing i was uh, thinking about at the moment was like oh shit I, I can't ruin the shot. I have to just play this out. What happened, happened. I just have to get out of the picture and hope that it uh, looked as genuine as it felt. <laughs> so I, I run out of the scene uh, and uh, the guy who's uh, responsible for choreography, he comes after me. And I was like, uh, dude, are you, are you all right? I was like, yeah, yeah, I think I'm fine. And his eyes uh, shoot up to my head. I was like, but dude, you're bleeding. <laughs> Uh, and the moment he says this, I feel this warm liquid kind of just starting to pour down over my scalp and down my forehead. So uh, at, at the same moment, uh, the, the co comedic timing of this couldn't be better. Uh, the producer comes over to me. It's like, dude, that was awesome. Can you do it again? <laughs> I'm like, no, <laughs> I, I, I'm bleeding. <laughs> I, have to, I have to get this fixed. So, uh, and uh, while they wrapped up, uh, the, one of the other actors, uh, she uh, wiped off the blood. It was coming in such uh, such amounts that I could, I could strike my hand, like uh, rub my hand over my forehead and just throw the blood to the floor. It was just so much of it on my hand. And uh, apparently I, I learned afterwards that this is very normal uh, for like wounds in your eyebrow and that area. There's large pockets of blood there. Uh, so it bleeds like crazy, but it doesn't really hurt all that much. So after I got like, <laughs> got this wiped off and I got this uh, Donald Duck plaster, like this uh, small plaster uh, over this wound, we, we headed to the um, uh, local uh, doctor's office, uh, which was open all the time. And this was like at 1 a.m. Uh, in the morning or 2 a.m. in the morning. It was really late. And we walk in there with these dark clothes, like these leather clothes. And with these latex vampire brows, and I got blood all over my face, and like the, the stuff she didn't manage to wipe off, and this Donald Duck plaster <laughs> on my forehead, I, I could see the guy behind the counter. He kind of, he looks at me, and he just he he make he does this slow rise from his chair. It's like what the hell is this? <laughs> the confusion like all over his play uh, over his face. And uh, I, I I saw my moment and I took it and I I just held up my hands like, it's okay. I'm an actor. <laughs> so that's probably one of the one of the funnier uh, stories that I had of this. Uh, I have one more, uh, which is uh, uh, the same uh, film, uh, um, a different film project. Uh, it was some kind of. Uh, crime uh, video and I was supposed to be a guy who uh, played both sides and then at the end uh, he kind of gets uh, pulled by a rope uh, over his neck by a car and the way they uh, simulated this is that they um, they had me lying on this uh, wooden board with wheels and uh, there was a rope attached to my waist uh, and this uh, rope wasn't attached to anything. And then it was uh, just led into this kind of, what do you call it, uh, when you roll up a rope uh, in a pile. And that was uh, attached to the car. So we were, uh, we were uh, I was just lying there waiting. I, I had the blood makeup in my face. I think there were like four or five groups of people who checked in on us because this was in a, a bit of an unsafer place part uh, of Oslo, if you can even call it that, uh, close to Grönland, uh, in a parking house there. And uh, I had all kinds of people come in from uh, a group of uh, young women who they refused to leave until they were s uh, certain that I was not being uh, actually pulled behind that car. <laughs> to a group of uh, young men who came over with uh, varying uh, expressions on their faces. Uh, one was filming me with his uh, uh, phone camera as it was looking like he was looking forward to what was going to happen. Another looked a bit concerned. Uh, a third one looked disinterested. It was like, you, you had the whole spectrum. And I was like, uh, hey, you guys going to kill him or what? <laughs> So that was kind of like the highlights. And then when we were finished and it was like, yeah, I think it was 3 a.m. or so. It was uh, very late. 
uh, and uh, our school was wall to wall with a bar. So uh, the others uh, were wrapping up their camera equipment and uh, moving, uh, uh, taking a bit of more time. So I was just standing outside the door because I didn't have access uh, at that time. Uh, normally our key started uh, stopped working after a certain time, like eight in the evening. And uh, there was this girl standing outside the bar talking to, uh, in her phone. I was like, oh, she was in a very good mood. And I was like, oh, blah, 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 blah. And uh, I, I can see that she is kind of slowly turning my way uh, as I'm just standing there waiting for the uh, the crew to come open the door. And I, I realize I still have all this bloody makeup in my face. And I look like I had my face pistol whipped. And uh, I, I kind of see where this is going. So as she turns, she she eventually she, she sees me. And she is like, ah, hello. And, and then she sees my face. <laughs> and then it's like, Huh? I can I can just see the wheels turning in her head. It's like, what am I seeing? And uh, then I just I just waved. I, I pointed at the camera crew, which uh, were finally coming uh, across the road, and she just looked over, shell shocked at them. Uh, I hope she figured that this was just film. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that's a kind of probably some of the stuff that uh, just uh, hangs uh, that I remember the most because uh, it was so absurd the whole thing. A great selection of stories. Thank you very much for sharing those. <laughs> so, considering that, you know, again, you're a singer, you've been in performances and whatnot, are there any bands or performers or um, any, anyone from, you know, the musical side of things that you personally would uh, love to collaborate with or perhaps you've ever thought about uh, releasing your kind of music, like any kind of singing uh, solo work, or anything of the sort? Uh, n nothing that I've uh, actively thought about because uh, classical music is more like um, you e either you're part of uh, a choir or an ensemble or you sing solo parts, but usually it's like a project kind of thing and people just get uh, uh, either you audition yourself in or you get uh, hired in uh, by reputation. And uh, you uh, you make like something great uh, then and there. So it's kind of, it's a, it's not like uh, when you uh, work with bands or that kind of stuff, uh, where you maybe more actively collaborate uh, to make something that is online. Uh, I don't have a lot of material that is online uh, because of this, pretty much. But it uh, it would probably be funny uh, or a, a very interesting to do something with maybe a classical edge to it. But uh, nothing that I've actively thought about, really. But if somebody needs a, a tenor <laughs> for something, <laughs> feel free to reach out. I'm open for most things. <laughs> outside of singing, performing, and uh, voice acting and all that jazz, outside of all that kind of stuff, how do you personally like to relax? Oh, well, there's a lot of video games. Um, uh, currently, I'm playing mostly a bit of RimWorld. Uh, they got some updates coming with uh, 1.5 and a new DLC, which I'm really uh, uh, interested in trying out. Um, aside from that, I also played a bit of Helldivers 2, which is which is great fun. The people I usually play with, they're, they're usually online when my daughter sleeps, and she sleeps like straight across the hall. And uh, I tend to get a bit uh, eager when I play, and the more eager I get, the louder I get. And uh, well, it, it's not a great mix uh, for making toddlers sleep. <laughs> so I, I haven't had a, uh, all that much uh, chance to play that game with my friends uh, recently. Aside from that, I, I usually like playing games with a lot of story in them. Kind of like, for example, Dead Space. Uh, horror games in general are uh, kind of my jam. I, I really like playing those. And uh, other kinds of fantasy or science fiction games. Uh, it doesn't have to be any particular kind of genre, really. But uh, story-rich games, uh, I really like. Or games that where you repair or make something uh, work again. Uh, kind of like Car Simulator. <laughs> uh, something like that. I also read a bit of books. Um, I'm, uh, I uh, recently picked up uh, a fourth uh, book in the Night Angel uh, cycle. I, I read that it was a, originally a trilogy. Brent Weeks, uh, he's a fantasy writer. Uh, he, he writes so vividly uh, on everything that is done. Uh, so he's uh, probably one of my favorite writers, him and Dan Abnett, uh, who writes mostly Warhammer 40k uh, novels. But he, uh, 
he also wrote the story for Alien Isolation, uh, which I also played the whole way through. And I was like, the moment I saw that Dan Abnett was writing the story for this, I was like, I know this is going to be good. <laughs> There's just no question about it. Uh, this is going to be good, or at least it's not going to be about the writing. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, there's there's uh, video games, there's uh, books, right? Uh, I I watch a bit of series. Um, currently, I'm uh, watching uh, My Hero Academia, uh, the anime, uh, with my wife. Uh, she thought that was really cool. Uh, I usually try to get her on board with some of these series, but she's like, yeah. at first, she was like, ah, meh. Uh, <laughs> not sure if she wanted to uh, or was interested in seeing that. But uh, I, eventually, I lured her to the to the dark side, so to speak, uh, and we found uh, some of these better series. But aside from that, it's uh, eh, well, nothing uh, nothing else hobby wise, really. Do a lot of refurbishment on our o old uh, house, uh, but I don't really feel that uh, qualifies. But yeah, yeah, I, I think that pretty much uh, summarizes it. Stig, let me just say, it's been an absolute blast chatting with you. Thank you so much for coming on board to this interview. Thank you, likewise. <laughs> it was great fun. And I'd personally like to thank all of my wonderful listeners out there for tuning into another great interview right here on The Cyberden. So Stig, thank you very much for coming, and watch out for all those uh, scary monsters out there. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Hey, this is Simon from the survival horror mod Cry of Fear. When I'm not battling my inner demons, I'm tuning into Jake the Voice on the Cyber Den.